Hey guys, this is Diane. I'm in Hollywood, California. My name is Dee. If you're watching this, you're a Swat Cats fan. And if you're like me, you've been one for decades. In March 2017, I got a chance to talk to the show's creators, help run a live stream event, and have a little fun while doing it. Did I mention I also got to hang out with Charlie Adler? Matt coordinated things and shot most of the footage. He also got Charlie a bottle of wine because he heard that's what T-Bone likes. We hope you'll enjoy this fan-made special feature for a show that's long overdue. Thanks for watching! Nice knowing you, Razor! Thanks, and it still will be. I've been saving this for last! So that was a scene from Destructive Nature, the first episode that Lance wrote for the show. And it was an all-around fun, fun adventure which kept both the SWAT cats and the Enforcers occupied in several different areas. t was in the air, Razor was inside the building, and the Enforcers were trying to get inside the building. So Lance, what was your favorite moment in Destructive Nature? I had a lot of fun doing that and kind of didn't know what I was doing at the time, so I didn't know what not to do. Probably, I like the what I call the Pac-Man scene where the uh, the creatures uh, chasing them up the elevator shaft. Really unexpected little action beat that was that was a little funny as well as scary. So the coast is clear, Doc. Use the deactivator now. No, I won't. Don't you fools understand? I created said. My very genius surrounds us. I won't let you destroy it. Oh, he's flipped! Yeah, we should have done this mission solo. Zed has united with its creator. We are one. Zed has found unity, found purpose. Okay, that was Unlikely Alloys, the final episode to air. Mm -hmm. Lance, did you envision or have any more ideas for Green Box after Chaos and Crystal and Unlikely Alloys? I sort of thought of the character as somebody I could possibly reuse as a as scientific help if the if the guys needed anything real sciencey they could go to him and you remember the second episode we met him mm -hmm. they went to him to solve a, a problem what happened is the story got away from me a little bit and that the character was <laughs> went insane and sort of unusable yeah. moving forward which i didn't know until the moment that he turned a lot of my writing process is having a basic idea of where i want to go pretty good idea about the ending and then making it up as I go along and at the point where it looked like the SWAT cats were going to save the day they needed another turn in there another escalation in threat and that's when one of their own turned on them and really empowered the, the threat and it was a, a more dramatic surprising story it was even surprising to me writing it so I imagine it would have been to the audience as a consequence of that the character is not really usable as an ally going forward. You can think of him as our version of Professor Hamilton who interacts with Superman when Superman needs, needs some science help. We'd either repair him or replace him. His complete 180 seemed rather abrupt. So would you say this was his pride as an inventor taking over, seeing all the potential his invention had, which was good or bad? I think a little of it was just being overwhelmed at what something he created was able to accomplish, good or, good or bad. His creation became something really, really extraordinary. And he was sort of seduced by the power of that. He probably on some level had a little parental pride and didn't want his kid or his creation to be destroyed. Maybe he could work with that kid. Yeah. But I would say in two words, he cracked. 
Making you a chauffeur the way you drive? Ha! That's so limited! Hey, it ain't no stupider than you doing housework. When's the last time you cleaned anything? I can clean your clock, tough guy. Hey, I think they towed our Metallic Hat Express to that big salvage yard, remember? Do I ever? That hovercraft had enough hardware to waste this whole town. Salvage yard, here we come. <laughs> you a chauffeur. <laughs> So Lance, you mentioned that you enjoyed writing episodes with the Metallicas because you could just blow them up and they could come back again and again. What is it about those two that you enjoy writing? Is it their relationship, their banter? Do you see them coming back in Revolution? Well, I love everything about them. Certainly the fact that even in a kid-friendly show, you can, you can be pretty destructive with them. You don't have to use a net. You don't have to use gas to knock them out. You can beat them up. As long as there's the, the chip left, basically, you can rebuild those villains. Then they have this banter that's this nice kind of f version of 40s gangster talk that's real fun. None of the other villains have like a partner they can really verbally spar with. That's a lot of fun. Moving forward, certainly if it were up to me, we'd, we'd do Metallicats because they're great villains. There's a lot we can do with them. I have a personally have a proprietary interest and pride and little sense of false ownership in them where, oh, right. I want to do those guys. Those are my guys. I think Glenn and Jim did great work with them, but I was a little jealous when someone else does them. <laughs> and I certainly, I would pitch, if it was an open form to pitch, I would definitely pitch a lot of Metallicat stories. In Bright and Shiny Future, once the robots are deactivated and Hackle makes his way inside, the Metallicas turn tail and run rather than outright confronting him. I think uh, if you put yourself in their shoes, this is a guy that built uh, a device with a press of the button could evaporate their personalities and memories. And that's probably the most frightening thing to them. If they have a fear, it's not getting, you know, banged up. It's being, being blanked. And he could do it before. So I think they're, I, I just think they're afraid of him. And you did mention that it is perhaps a pre-programmed thing in them to never attack him. And that might be in play as well. So considering the vast armament in both the Turbo Cats Bay and the Glavatrixes, not to mention the vehicles, does Jake just sit around with a sketchbook and come up with stuff on a slow day? Or is he just the kind of guy who, whose mind just tends to be filled with ideas and he won't rest until he has them all down? I think he's an impulsive tinkerer. And I think he's a character that would be very excited when an experimental rocket or a jet or something had its like remains dumped or a failed prototype or something dumped into the salvage yard that he has new toys to play with. I think his ideas of what to invent come out of combat experience. Like he's, you know, they're, in, they're engaged with something and he probably thinks, you know what we should have had here? And then works on that uh, going forward. Are we to assume that in the first season the SWAT cats were planning and or taking notes as they went along? We were sort of thinking what would be nice to have here, and that's in our heads, to put in next time. The real global answer, it's a little lazy, I suppose, is we're gonna give, him, give them what they need to make the best story we can. We can. All right, and as an addendum, would you say that, that the glow attractions are voice activated, trigger activated, both? I think they're both. All right. So you mentioned that a lot of your ideas were inspired from 1950s comic books and James Bond, like the Helicarrier and Cry Turmoil. With all the recent success of Disney Marvel's Avengers movie universe, has inspiration hit for any future episodes? Well, no stories in particular. I read a lot. I look at a lot. And it's all in there somewhere, stirring around. I try not to be too obvious about it. I thought I would get away with the Helicarrier because it was in some 1960s comics and then kind of gone. And <laughs> then <laughs> there wasn't a major motion picture, so, so you can bust me on that. I try not to be too obvious about that, but I like, what I like is the tone of something. I like seeing a rhythm of a story, like emotional shifts and reverses and things that, that give me these oh wow moments that I like to put in a story. The last scene of, probably my favorite thing in any Swag Cats I did was the last scene in my first Metallicats episode where Farrell did this reverse. And it's not right. even the main character, but and I couldn't tell you where that moment might have even been inspired from, 
but it's th ideas like that where it's unexpected and kind of delightful that I, I want to put in as much as I can. Mayor Mangs, can you tell us exactly what's been happening on Anakata Island? Ah, uh, it's been a truly spectacular groundbreaking, Anne, for Mr. Young here's new high-tech industrial park and uh, golf course. What? Is there a reason why Mr. Young keeps returning to Mac at say to do business, given the insanity that they've witnessed during each visit? Well, it's funny. They're clearly not learning, <laughs> learning from mistakes. Manx is not a great guy to deal with. Um, I think in, in a lot of ways, they're cautionary tales for, for their eventual successors, whether it's Cali or another business consortium. It's comforting to the audience a little bit to see a familiar face, mm -hmm. and you kind of know what to expect. And then you can, you can reverse that expectation if you need to, so. I may be down, but I'm not out. Eat bazooka, you space scum. Gotcha. So Lance, Felina played integral roles in a good majority of the episodes you've written. Was it about your character, about her character, that you enjoy writing? Well, I like I like everything about her. I think her main purpose that we all used in creating the character was meaning the Tremblays, Glenn Davis, myself. We all had this discussion that the face of the enforcers, the enforcers are essentially the peacekeepers and the cops and the military, and the only personality we really see is Farrell, who's who's an antagonist, and they're not bad guys. The idea of having an enforcer in there that's really great at their job and really uh, essential, necessary, competent, intelligent, capable, all those things. Also, we need a little more girl power in the show that we were kind of lacking. I gave them the, the good female villain in uh, Turmoil. You right. know? So that's certainly a little sub-agenda of mine. But I just, I just like her. I like the fact that she's, uh, they don't have a crush on her. They just mm -hmm. respect her, her work and consider her an ally and consider her a really, a really useful, uh, competent resource. Dr. Greenbox, you said you could help him. Can you? Maybe, but I need to get back to my lab. Then let's go! So Kelly can clearly hold her own in a fight, given the several times she's managed to escape or aid the SWAT cats using the first blunt object she could find. Has being deputy mayor for a red or dangerous city driven her to maybe realize that she can't always rely on the enforcers or the SWAT cats to rescue her? She's, she's well aware of needing to step up for Manx, her mm -hmm. boss who's not very competent. She's in these situations where she has to uh, defend herself. It's certainly, I think, that the perpetual damsel in distress is tedious and a little Lois Lane-ish, and we you know, don't need to go down there I think moving forward, she's just kind of biding her time until, until Mank steps down and she can replace him and run the city properly. Are we ever going to get a look into how she ended up with the communicator to contact the SWAT cats? Are we going to see like a first mission flashback episode when they first started off as, as the vigilantes in, in that cat city? Well, usually I would answer that question with, um, uh, I, I'm flattered, we're flattered that people are projecting backstory where we don't have backstory, that they love the show so much they want to know every little nook and cranny and make it real uh, for them. And that's, uh, that happened a lot on Johnny Quest um, with me. Like, where, what do they do? What are they studying in school? All these things. And the honest truth is we don't think about things like that. We just think about those 22 minutes and the most entertaining way of telling those 22 minutes. However, in that case with that question, I like that question, is there is obviously a story about where they gave her a communicator because she's, you know, I mean, they're vigilantes and they're, yeah. they're handing to a city official. Here's how you get a hold of us when your cops can't handle it. Mm -hmm. And there is definitely a story there. Now, probably Glenn would be the one to tell that story, but that's, that's, that should be on a little checklist of things we need to do. A little bit of housekeeping. 
What is, what is Dark Hat's backstory? And if you're not ready to tell us yet, will we know in Revolution? I don't know. I suspect the brothers know. Now, we talked about this at the panel a little bit in uh, Texas last year. And, and I think the consensus was that the great Dark Hat story hasn't been told yet. We teased him, we introduced him, we certainly kind of gave him a little, a little screen time. But he's, he's a fellow you have to peel away and peel away and, and get to. He has a lot of secrets and a lot of resources we don't know about yet. I think it's safe to say, without knowing for a fact, without having the conversation, that there's a really, really big dark cat story that hasn't been told yet and that we look forward to the opportunity to telling that. My lapel? Oh, that, that part. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs>